Woo doggy! You thought Joe was nervous doing our live shows? Well, y'all, we're about to make that boy nervous as a piglet at a hog roast. <laughs> but not only is tonight's show streamed live on our YouTube channel, but for the first time ever, we'll be taking live phone calls from our listeners. So kick the tires and light the fires. It's time to kick off the training wheels and make this baby ride. So my friends, pull up a chair, adjust your volumes just right, and welcome to Blue Collar Elk Hunting. Welcome to Blue Collar Elk Hunting, brought to you by ElkGrows.com, with your host, Gilbert Ornelas, and elk hunting coach, Joe Gilly. You want to hunt elk? And they live to hunt elk. Their goal is to share with you what they have learned grinding it out for over 35 seasons doing what they love. So come on into camp and set a spell. Welcome to Blue Collar Elk Hunters. Well, fellas, you asked for it, you got it. You got the big crew on. We've got coaches in the house. We got WWJGD, nervous as a cat on a hot tin roof. And we're going live with phone calls and live internet questions. We've got the world champion elk caller himself, Mr. Travis O'Shea's in the house. We got the Flatlander. Our elk hunting coaches are represented tonight with Cole Wilkes and Kyle Duplanche. Absolutely, with his cool man, bad to the bone, throwback mustache. He means rocking the stash. We've got, you know, the Venezuelan mafias in the house, the legend, the cowboy himself sitting back there with WWJGD. Always nice to have the ninja Lee Roy Chavez in the house and we got it teed up and we're ready to answer questions guys so this is uh something new for us so like Joe said if we mess up or get something wrong we'll get it right I promise <laughs> how is everybody nervous yeah, yeah good. man <laughs> I'm nervous for Joe <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> this is a first time for us to do something like this um I'm interested to see what happens if we get a phone call. I'm looking at the phone, man. I'm like. (laughs) (laughs) But but one thing that we're going to do, guys, is we actually have a topic for tonight. The question that comes in from one of our listeners. When I saw this question, I was like, man, this is some good stuff. This is somebody that's been listening and somebody has been writing stuff down and has some seriously good questions on on decisions about scenarios, about calling, about setups, about partner versus solo. So there's some really, really good stuff in that. The, the other day, man, uh, this guy and Trav and my, myself, man, we shipped out about 40 orders that uh, has been coming in. The, these puppies were... <laughs> We're going out. Mm-hmm. Um, the sugar was hitting the trail. Travis, they're amazing too, brother. I mean, I about wore mine out that I got from you, but I got I got plenty more. I know where to get some more. That's for sure. Yeah, yeah, Man, they're, exactly. They're, they're fantastic. I've been trying to do something for Joe every week. Uh, I put a little thing together where they, you know some tech tech tip of the week or something like that, give him a, a review. And I did one for you guys and one for Mark Crawford as well. And um, I'm telling you, the the calls that you guys are producing. They're going to be game changers this year, man, for sure. I don't know if anybody realizes this, but Travis, you know, he's pulling the old Gilbert right now, man. So, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he's, so, so I got in my truck at 7 a.m. this morning, and I just literally pulled it up, still scrambling to get ready here. And uh, uh-huh. I'm still about 45 minutes from my destination, but I got good service here. So <laughs> so you're, you're actually out of show for the next two days there in what city in Canada, bud? Yeah, I'm heading to Kamloops, British Columbia. Or no, sorry, uh, Kelowna, British Columbia. Okay. And uh, so we got a Friday, Saturday, Sunday trade show. And I got to do a big private elk calling seminar Saturday night for probably 100 people or so. It's going to be awesome. Fantastic, man. Good good luck on that, man. I know you're going to be killing it over there, man. Yeah, we're going to rock it. And we're we're actually going on the radio station tomorrow morning at 630 to do a live in studio uh seminar type thing on oh, their morning awesome. on, cool. on yeah, their morning cool. drive thing <laughs> should be pretty cool 
So is that a Fu Manchu I see on you too, man? You like getting rough? Yeah, yeah man. Uh, he's kind of got it going on, dude. He's got a little goatee involved, though, man. He's hey, you know what? Up, you know why he did that, right? That's because my podcast, man. He came on. He got pimped out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Your hair Friday, huh? Got to do the old I, salt, I will say, salt and pepper. right for folks that you know, for folks, Travis is our neighbor of the north, but. You know, if if you guys are interested, you really need to get a hold of Travis and, and get some coaching from him. Listen to the Wapiti River stuff. And I mean, phenomenal, right? The instruction that that Travis gives, um, it, it's so easy for a guy to take up and learn from. So, yeah, big shout out to my brother over there in the at least on my screen in the bottom corner. Thanks, guy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he's yeah, he's too cool in school, man. Yeah. yeah. We got a message from old Troy Robinson when when, when we uh, showed the calls here. He said, I was going to order the new calls, but figured I'd just wait since I'll get them when I win that elk hunt. <laughs> Come on, brother. I like get your confidence. Better not, better not wait. You better have your calling yeah. down. <laughs> yeah. Better better odds get getting in that deal, man. Yeah. yeah. Need to practice. Yeah. So right now we still, we, you know, last time we talked on the show, I think we had, I think I said we had about 47 single entrants. Now that's individual. Some of those individuals have got multiple entries because they've spent money in the store and stuff like that. Um, I think uh, our, probably our top individual with multiple entries probably has 10 entries that which is pretty impressive they've gone to the store and got a lot of stuff in there and uh uh i'm gonna actually answer and i'm gonna answer this right now do it do it do it it. yeah we actually got our (laughs) first caller on here man Uh, hey keith you there Uh, keith yeah i'm here all right do me a favor i'm gonna i'm gonna yell this out just real quick on on this and we're gonna pull you in and have you talk with us man so uh okay awesome so what i was saying is last time i believe we had 47 individuals enter well right now we are still since that time and you want to talk about your odds (laughs) y'all we are under 70 individuals entered in this right now oh so (laughs) Yeah, I mean, just just imagine what the odds are on that compared to anything else. And Cole, tell me something, Cole. You applied to be able to hunt in New Mexico in the draw, right? Yeah. Yep. What did that run you, bro? So it would be like yeah. eight hundred bucks. Yeah. Yeah. It's just the eight hundred dollars up front to have a chance at a six percent of everybody else putting in, right? Yeah, and it could be thousands putting yeah. in. Yeah, and so oh, I explained it to a guy the other day. I was like, "Look, it's just the plain math of it is just you're winning." You know, if you look at the odds, like if you spend that same dollar amount in the store, like I'm not just trying to tell everybody to go spend 800 bucks in Joe's store, but if you were to do that, your opportunity <laughs> would probably be oh, it increases. Vast. Yeah, you're, you're going to increase a thousandfold. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm pissed about it. <laughs> but you're, and you're getting you're, i mean you're getting gear from it too right i mean you're talking to that's a heck hey of a so I, I don't want to avoid them here too long man uh, uh but uh, guys if you have not put in for man there is over 40 grand in prizes out there uh coming to hunt with us is just part of it that twenty eight thousand dollar camper man this is an outrageous opportunity so make sure you do that keith you there bro yes sir how are you doing man man i'm doing great how are you you know for to have somebody call in on our first time here (laughs) you don't know how cool this is is everybody hearing him okay Yes, yeah. sir. Yes, sir. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, Keith, man, what's your question for yeah. today? Hey, so I listened to Travis and Guy on their show today, and Travis sounds like he's just out there flirting with the elk. Like, they're just <laughs> everywhere. Got, uh, you know, he can take his pick of the herd, right? And you guys are always finding elk. But that is my problem, is I can never seem to find the, the elk. So my question to you is, you guys packed up and moved camp and uh, almost right away when you were here in Colorado. Right. What are what was your key decisions to say, hey, there's not enough elk in this area and I need to move? It's a great question, man. 
Yeah, mm. I don't I don't know that it was so much that there wasn't enough elk in that area. I mean, so what we did was we divided and conquered, man. And you know, all of us had different places that we were going. All the guys were scouting in the area that we were camped in and for some reason knowing that I had that kind of party behind me there in that area, I was like there's someplace else I wanted to check because of something that I had seen. And I'll tell you what I was looking for was this, is I found an area that was wilderness area. I think a lot of people go into that wilderness area. And I found public land just off of that wilderness area that I felt like people going in there or people driving around there was going to actually create animals that would go into this other area. And I was like, I just wanted to take a look at it. So I got up early. I don't know. I left about three in the morning yeah. go over there, just wanted to check it out. And all I did was do a walkabout. Um, I did a little bit of calling in there. In fact, I, I kind of screwed up and called in a bull on opening morning, the same bull that Luis ended up killing a few yeah. days later. Um, yeah. But yeah, I, I think when I got that there. That was actually all a day of, before opening morning. Yeah, it was a day before. When I saw the sign that I saw and the animal that I brought in and the amount of cows that I saw, immediately I was like, we know that there's going to be bulls in here. We know that there's going to be elk in here. And it was just something that I felt like an area that was different from where we were that, man, there were so many campers and trailers and the roads were so good that I think I just wanted to go check something that was maybe a little bit more off the beaten path a little bit mm -hmm. um, and something that carried elk. So when I went in there and called in the first day and saw what I did, I went back with my report and I was like, y'all, I think we need to pull up and leave. I see uh, elk, you know, uh, scat and that sort of things. And I see well-used trails, but I'm just not finding them. So I guess I was trying to like gauge of uh, you know, obviously, if I'm not seeing fresh scat, man, I, I got to pull chocks and go or. Agreed. Um, when Joe came back with all his information, RC and I and everybody else had, had been on a scouting uh, expedition. And we did find some elk, but we didn't find what we wanted to see. And there was tons of uh, participation, uh, people, right, where we first mm -hmm. sat up. Yeah. So when Joe found something that he thought was a little <clears throat> hidden gem, Man, I mean, we packed up camp and left. And I mean, we decided, I say we packed up camp. We we actually didn't leave yeah. our camp. We right. left the next morning and drove over and hunted that area. Mm -hmm. And it was so promising. Uh, RC, myself, and the, the Pennsylvania cat killer, Brendan Houlihan, we went into several different areas that Joe sent us to. And we weren't very far away from Joe and uh, his his group, right? But what we found is where you did not find any elk. So what I what I, I think guys gonna get to is that within areas are little hot spots of other areas, right? Um, and those are the places that you want to go look and turn over every nook and cranny. We don't know whether you were down low or whether you were up high above, you know, tree line or whether you were down low in the lower regions of where you're hunting, but I can tell you, Joe, uh, Joe was in a certain area that had a ridge that was loaded with cows and elk, but they were very quiet and they weren't talking a whole lot. Right. But the sign was there. You had fresh scat, you had blown up trees. You could smell them. They were in these wallows that were up there that we found. Uh, but RC and I weren't what a mile and a half, two miles to the, to the Southwest of them. And it was like, <laughs> Nothing. I mean, there weren't the help to be found. So we 100% did our job in finding where they were not. And the boys, Manano <laughs> and, and, and Luis, got in the middle of them hot and heavy right off the bat in, in a yep. little area that was just flanking where Joe and them were. So uh, what I will tell you is if you're not seeing sign, I can tell you that's an, a clear indication that there's probably not – fresh sign there and there's not elk in that immediate area but, but that's not right that's but not you're saying, necessary. you're saying you're seeing sign right keith uh yeah there's certainly um uh, maybe a few day old sign but none of the green you know uh 
pasty stuff, if you will. Yeah, yeah, yeah but that's an old sign. Mm-hmm. It's hard yeah. to tell how old that sign is. And, and are you smelling elk at all? Are you smelling urine? Are you seeing, you know, are you know what kind of sign besides, you know? And when you say this, so you're looking at poop that's a little bit brown. It's not green, but you can still smush it? Y- yeah, and occasionally I'll get that lovely elk smell, and, you know, the, I can tell that there's a wall or two that's been – been been splashed through but you uh you know if i set up a camera on there or i go sit on that water hole it it'll uh you know i'll just be bored counting sticks you know yeah <laughs> so, I, can yeah. i chime in here real yeah. quick yeah, yeah go ahead guy well, so I, I i don't know how to address the whole thing you know expeditiously here but you know sometimes we overthink what we're looking for right and then we'll, we'll find that area we'll get into a little sign and then we'll decide that that's the area i need to be in and generally, you know, we're looking for for bigger country for some reason. And then Keith, you know, I, I kind of know where you hunt and you know where I was at last year. And man, it was busy. It was crowded. The muzzleloader season hit and and the elk were invisible. They were inaudible. They weren't yeah. making a lot of noise. And it was just a matter of me slowing down, um, getting real, real quiet and then picking their noise out of, you know, out of the air essentially so i don't i don't want you to get held up on just looking for sign the one area we were in when we had the exodus there wasn't a drop of anything i couldn't tell that there was an elk there for a year and within wow five six hours you know we're, we're covered in animals so don't don't get held up and overthink the area and then you really have to and i'm not sure how long for me it's about four or five hours if there's nothing going i'm gonna look you know where am i going next i'm gonna move on maybe i'll make it to the afternoon and then i'm moving to the next area so just don't get hold, held up and overthink in the area or just go daggum silent if you're going to work it the whole day and, in my and opinion. I, i'll tell you another thing too dude is if it's like an area you've never been in before, it's a little bit different. If I've been there before and and I have seen elk in an area one year before, two years before, then I'm going to spend a little more time because I truly believe elk <clears throat> like to go back to the same areas year after year. There can be some things that change that, but it's like predators or something happens with um, the food source or it's really dry or something like that. That can change it a little bit. But if if I went into an area like, and I can tell you this, where we hunted last year, our hunt, where I killed my bull, dude, we had to work our butt off. To, we didn't see fresh droppings anywhere for days, but there were elk in there. So it's not always... It's not always the droppings that always prove it, you know. We just didn't, yeah. we were in more of their transition area than their bedding areas, so we weren't finding exactly. that as much. Or in their feed areas, we were like where they were going from one place to another. Yeah, and transition area. Yeah, we were like, man, these elk don't friggin' crap out here, man. It was just, <laughs> well, it was just, that way. Unless you caught them in the transition, you weren't going to see them there. And that's that's the big thing is you you stated that you found a waller or a water hole where you thought they'd been. You know, if Chad didn't if Chad didn't sit his water holes during the midday, he'd have told you nothing came in there, right? But as he sat those midday sits, he saw more bulls than we did because he was there midday, right? So I mean, that's another thing is you know tr- hunting out of traditional times when you know instead of being on in the morning or the evening at the wall i hunt that midday when it starts warming up and see if the animals are frequent in that as well because i know chav could have killed i don't know five or six bulls sitting there by himself and then yeah. how plentiful is the water yeah right i mean we're picking yeah. out wallows sitting on a bench but how plentiful is the water if we got a good year and there's a ton of water on that mountain man that's a rough one and, and I, i'm not big on setting water in the first place i mean i really think that uh once hunters get in the woods they're either going to be there like if you're going to be there like chav did they're going to be midday a lot of times when a lot of guys mm-hmm. aren't expecting to see it or they're going to go nocturnal like they do down in the gila man they're going to come in after dark um i've just never had a lot of success sit- sitting water i like to find the areas where they're going back and forth i'll like find where the trails are and the tracks are that are going to the water and reverse engineer but i think i'll tell you this keith man i think you almost have to start to get a feel for stuff being in there. You have to almost, and it's hard for you because you don't have that gut sense of experience yet that's going to happen for you. But when I get in and I start seeing fresh track, you know, when I start seeing torn up areas, not even necessarily dropping where I haven't smelling, but I'm seeing track on trails, you know, that's fresh, 
then, man, I'm going to get on those. I'm going to go start following those things. I'm going to be just like a, a, a dog on a bone. And, and that's really what happened in Colorado. When I got in there, I got in those areas where they're going to walk. I got on those ridge top areas. I got in those areas, a third down where they're going, you know, side hilling through. I found areas from feed and water where those trails are coming from. And I just started running those trails to see what track I came across. And then, you know, once I got on that track, man, I started seeing critters because I was yeah. getting into the places that they were going to. Yeah. So, yeah. And, and I, I, could... I think a lot of guys get hung up on uh, hunting an area that is a nighttime area for the elk, right? If like there's might be a, some sign in there and it might be on one ridge. I know in Colorado, a lot of times those elk will move ridge to ridge and they might not be back on that ridge for three, four, five, six days later. And, you, you know, just identify the nighttime area. Is this an area that an elk is going to spend their time at feeding all night? Then don't waste your time in those areas. There might be a ton of sign, but get somewhere that's going to, the elk are going to be spending their daytime um i think a lot okay, of guys confuse right. that sign on the night side of the mountain if that makes any sense or yeah, yeah. or even <laughs> down low in areas where they're that. bedding mm-hmm. at night yeah, yeah. absolutely yeah, yeah. And, i mean yeah. if you listen to paul Medell or you listen to Corey jacobson they love getting in the bedroom areas man that's us and i mean and that's what we did de- mm-hmm. that's what we're looking for is where those elk are going to bed down and if i can find that area it's it's doomed for them critters because I'm we're gonna set up and ambush them where those transitional areas are and we've already found out now that they're using that area to bed down in right so those are the areas where you can go in there and kill not just one bull but you can kill multiple elk in those areas and we did that in Colorado so so Keith let me let me jump back and be more simplistic man you were like what made you decide to pull up yeah. camp and move. And it's because I had elk, man. I had elk spotted. I had elk on me. I had elk track, scent, sign. So to me, that was all the check marks, which on the other areas over there, I didn't have that nailed down like that. So I felt like we were just going to get better production and, and by moving to that location. To, to add into that, Joe, <clears throat> what Guy was saying, he gets in there and he gets really quiet. And I do the same thing. So I take Joe's tactic, get on that trail, follow the tracks, the direction they're going, see where they're going to end up, and you find cool stuff along the way. But a lot of our elk, if you're 150 yards out, they won't make a peep. So you got to kind of go in there and you got to move along really slow. And that's what Guy's saying, like, get in there, move a little bit, and then sit and listen. And if you're not hearing nothing, move a little bit more. And you can throw some cow cow sounds out there, you know, rake a tree while you're sitting there so you're not bored as, you know, everything can be. But if you're not hearing nothing, maybe move 75, 100 yards. Don't go crazy. Don't go too far. Because what's going to happen is you're going to, all of a sudden you're going to burst their little bubble where all of a sudden you're within 75, 80 yards. And now he's going to, or he'll rake a tree or, He'll make some kind of noise and okay, now the game's on, right? Yeah. yeah. But that's yeah. that's not me day one. Day one I'm not like that, Keith, man, because you know, even like that pre day before that, you know, I'm I'm actually moving a lot more, especially it's a pre day, you know. I uh, I'm moving a lot more because I'm wanting to see stuff or smell stuff or or take things in that are gonna tell me that there's elk in the area. You know, if 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 I see that, then I become Travis, like what Travis was doing right there. You, you know, I have to, before I actually, before I speed up and slow down, I have to have something that, that gives me that sense that I need to slow down and hang in an area. You know, Manano's always trying to stop me. He's always like, you know, Joe, <laughs> stop and listen, man. You know, <laughs> but I actually, you know, you I'm very hear aggressive. Anyway. He can't hear nothing anyway, so y'all don't have to worry yeah. about it. But when you have, look, look, when you have a nose like this, man. Yeah, yeah. With the yeah, eyes yeah. that I yeah. have. Uh, that's right. Yeah. That's right. So, so what's good about that is, is I'm not really, 
you know, we talk about hunting silent elk. I'm always hunting silent elk. That's, yeah. I have to in some senses, right? Heck yeah. You know, so I on I'm usually moving, moving, and there has to be a reason. I've either caught a scent, I've either seen something, or I've heard something, or I got fresh, fresh track on, I'm a, you know, crap mm -hmm. or, or urine on the it. ground. That's yeah. going to give me reason then to slow down and just listen and then do a scenario. So, you know, um, I need to cover area early on because I'm basically um, hunt yeah. scouting, right? Yeah. So, you know, mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. do I pass by some maybe? Well, I might doing that, but I will have a better figure on the entire kind of area that I'm at, and it'll it'll give me more confidence in the area. That's just me. You know, Trav hunts the same places that he hunts every year. He knows where those um, bedding areas are. He knows where those layers are. He knows where those bulls like to stay. But when you go into a new area, you've got to get a little more comfortable. And even like, yeah. you know, seeing what you have on your Onyx and how that boots on the ground actually fits to what you're seeing and, and starting to put those pieces to the puzzle. What I tell you, man, is just get out there, start filling in pieces of the puzzle, start getting around, take a look at the puzzle and start filling in those pieces and then making some decisions. If you go around, like you do that five hours of what guy's talking about and you ain't seen crap, literally, you know, it's time to pull stakes <laughs> and get out of there, man. Yeah. Right. You know, how, what are you doing to, to approach the situation? What are you throwing out? Are you locating your cow calling your calf calling, right? Look at the approach you're taking as well as you evaluate those things. And so do you, do you I hunt by yourself. I I do have a partner with me at, at some times, but I'm mostly a solo hunter. Yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. And Keith, man, I, I thank you, dude, man. You you've been a, a great listener. Um, you've you know you've been following us for a while. You're just a great guy, man. And uh, I just want you to know how much we appreciate you. Absolutely. And, thank you. And how much we're in your corner for you to yeah, succeed, man. brother. Yeah, man. We'll be pulling for you, brother. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I'll come yeah, pack okay. out for thank you, bro. You very much, guys. Thank you, man. Bet, man. See you. Mm -hmm. See you in a couple of weeks. Thanks for man. calling in. Yeah. Great no question. Take care. We have number one. Yes. Uh, <laughs> have, uh, Richard, Richard Dolly asked a question on uh, on the YouTube feed. You want me to read that, Joe? Yeah, go ahead. All right. Hey, fellas. Glad to see everyone. Love all the content and all the knowledge being passed down. As far as e-scouting, what are key features to check while out hunting? I'm not able to narrow it down. <clears throat> I guess uh, so. Like my my first go to whenever I'm e scouting is uh, I just try to. I, man, it's it's so oh, hard, gosh. right? Because a unit could be so giant, right? I just start immediately start picking little things out that I uh, hmm. I guess that I like to look for, like timber cuts, uh, clear cuts, burns. Um, and then access to those areas. Water. Uh, um, Water. And I basically like to draw, a, you know, like a boundary. I try not to hunt anywhere near a trail or, um, you know, I, I like to be a proximity away from a trail and find those kind of remote uh, food sources, kind of like what Manano was saying. Uh, yeah. Burns, beetle kill. Uh, and, 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 and timber know, cuts. Another huge. thing is try to avoid blowdowns, bro. Blowdowns. Yeah, <laughs> no, I'm trying to get some really good aerial views that are recent, man. I guess that ooh, depends on the blowdown, man, because some of them are bro. produced. And I and I'm yeah. I'm the same, right? I mean it's it's hard with when you're e scouting, right? Especially if you got an 18, 15, 20 hour drive to that area. Yeah. But you know, mm -hmm. there's there's such a discrepancy in what we're looking at. So I would say to narrow that down, just really get comfortable with reading those contours and uh, yeah. and get away from those roaded areas. But look at look for those little timber patches um, that aren't too far off that beaten path that have those benches and and you know, some slope. water and what down and man, saddles. Oh man, yeah, saddles, transitional areas. Um, yeah, when when, you, when Joe talks about saddles, my my knuckles aren't as, as big as his, but these saddles that are between the ridges, right? They they connect the ridges together, and those saddles that we hunt, man, will have they'll have little telltale signs where where there be fingers that run from the top of that ridge down to a bottom where there be water, 
or a yeah. feed area or something like that. But they use they use these saddles and these ridges between the between the actual mountains that are there, and uh, the elk love to use those as corridors to travel through. Right. So I look mm-hmm. for those but in nor- and also north facing slopes where they're going to want to bed down and stuff and and uh, use that for cover. Yeah. Hey, fellas, um, I'm going to bring in Ed Morris, our buddy from Ed. Kentucky. Brother Ed. <laughs> Louisville. Ed, Ed, you there? Ed? Oh, yeah, I'm here. <laughs> awesome, man. Welcome to the show, Ed. Well, glad to be here as always. Uh, of course, it had not been that long since you and I spoke, Joe, just, what, three or four days ago. Yeah, 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 yeah. But uh, I have a, a silly question, but it, it's it's not quite as silly as it sounds. Everybody in the woods, especially like where I hunt, southern Colorado or parts of Idaho, uh, public land, a lot of people. And I've lost time before listening to calls. Not everybody in the woods, I realize, is a Joe Gillia or Corey Jacobson or a Travis O'Shea. But I have wasted an hour and a half to two hours sometimes only to find out that I'm just working another set of hunters. And I've mm-hmm. had last year, I, I guess uh, I didn't sound too bad because I called in several groups of hunters and <laughs> sat there and worked each other for an hour and a half or so. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, so, so when you're doing that, is there is there a simple, not a simple, but an easy way where you can pick out and say, oh, wait a minute, that's, that's that's uh, John Smith over there, or somebody Joe Blow over there. That's not another elk. <laughs> or do you mm, yeah. actually maybe take advantage of them at times if they're working? There it is. They're calling one side and you're on the other. Do you yeah. maybe take advantage of them, or do you try to pick out something you can say, nope, that's not an elk. I'm going to keep moving forward. <laughs> so hmm. I'm going to let somebody else take a jab first. Anybody want to jump in? I would say absolutely. Travis and I talked about it. You got to play the entire freaking board, right? It's a game of chess on public land, play Mm -hmm. everything. And worst case scenario, you work into new hunters or other hunters and then just play off of them. Right. Um, And it's hard. It's getting harder to pick guys out in the woods. Uh, I think, I think everybody is, is really on their grind in terms of keeping that call in their mouth. And it's just getting more and more difficult. I did a podcast with with Mr. Mark Carlton, and one of the things that that he reminded me of was pay attention to that cadence. Right, a lot of times we'll be so mechanical uh, in our structure of our calling that we can pick that out. You know, as, as the elk is not going to be so mechanical because we have a regimen that we choose when you know when we're talking the language. Yeah. I um, I yeah. the the other thing I, I was. I would comment there is it, it may be just my impatient nature. Um, but I think, <laughs> I, I don't think it'll take me an hour to figure out whether nope. it's an elk or a human. No, no sir. You know? So, I mean, you, you gotta, you gotta figure that out beforehand. And if you're not, m- maybe you're not making the right approach to the elk, even if it was an elk. Right. Yeah. yeah. It, yeah immediately when we get somebody that that's going to respond to something we've done, we're going to cut the distance tremendously. Mm-hmm. Right. I mean, we're going to get in what, what we call that that kill bubble. Right. And mm-hmm. within that hundred yard range. And uh, and then we'll send mm-hmm. out a few things that we know for sure are going to be. Well, I mean, nine times out of ten, uh, if you get somebody that's, you know, bugling at you insistently 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 you you pretty well know especially when you get in that in that bubble and it quits now you know you're probably in the middle of something with a bull that's got some cows right so it, as soon as you get an uh, a an assessment of what's going on and really it's about you cutting that distance and then understanding what the elk's saying to you right not only do you understand what you've projected but when they get an answer, what has the bull said, right? Well, if the bull answers you and he's got this big round up bugle that he's done and stuff like that, or, or he answers you with a location bugle, I mean, that should tell you what's going on, right? Uh, so reading that language uh, would probably key you into whether it's a real bull or whether it's a another hunter, right? 
So, and you can step on them too, to figure that out as well. But mm -hmm. I would say, like Luis said, getting, getting in there closer, mm -hmm. trying to cut the distance and put eyes on what's answering you is the key factor. I was going to say, uh, if the calling's pretty uh, insistent and, and uh, you're getting pretty close and the wind's going up here, going right towards that sound, it's not going to be an elk. That's a wisdom right yeah, there. Yeah, so think of when when uh, direction. Also. Yeah. But uh, what Chav is what Chav is saying is exactly yeah, where I would be right. going with it is is you gotta read the behavior of what's happening. Yeah. You know? Um yeah, and, and I and I lost Ed on the phone call, but um I don't know like were each of them moving? Was one following the other? Were they moving yeah. away? But, you know, if you've got somebody that's calling back and forth to you from the same location and it's and it's like seven o'clock in the morning and they're staying in the same location and, and this is yeah. depending on what sounds they're making, that's mm -hmm. just not elk behavior that wouldn't be what happening that bull would have been way mm -hmm. bored way ahead of time made a move away made a move towards you and and i'm with luis me if i got a critter that's doing something like that man i'm gonna see him yeah. <laughs> you know we're gonna go to him yep. I, yeah i'm gonna be i'm gonna be doing something moving towards that animal to where i'm gonna see it if that if that other hunter just kept sounding off i guarantee i would have seen that booger just by sneaking in on him too if he kept sounding off there's you know so i read what's happening and like chav said that yeah. wind is a giveaway i mean if if that person you know you've got the wind going their way and they're still calling to you or you know um you've got somebody that is um and it's first thing in the morning and they're moving down the hill away from bedding areas uh, if it's you know late in the evening you know different things that are happening that are telling you that that is not elk behavior and i yeah. think that's kind of with the caveat yeah, thing, though, right, Joe, is is it's always worth going and ch cutting the distance. Absolutely. Cut checking the distance. it out. Yeah. There ain't if nothing anything, worse. I'm going to shake the dude's hand and wave yeah. at him, right? Yeah. Ain't yeah. nothing worse than finding out that that hunter you thought wasn't an elk is an elk. Yep. <laughs> some of the worst, some of the Travis, worst Travis, elk Travis, sounds what, I've ever shake Travis has, yeah. been from elk. Uh, just in listening to that same bugle over and over, because uh, people are creatures of habit, that yeah. sound is going to be the exact same, and you know, eight guys out of 10 are going to throw out a location bugle and then they're going <laughs> to chuckle right after it. And it's going to be the same bugle and chuckle every time. Mm -hmm. So if you hear that like four or five times in a row, a, a real bull is not going to do that. Or else the other thing is they'll bugle and then they'll throw like four or five, six cow calls right after it. Yeah. That doesn't happen in real life. You know, yeah. it's, that's not how the herd works. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say that uh, the elk have a cadence, typically how everything goes about in the woods. If you blow a bugle and something answers you every single time and you mm -hmm. don't necessarily know, more times than not, it's a, it's a hunter that's getting excited because he thinks you're a bull as well. So just keep that in mind. Like it's a lot of times guys get super excited to hear that bugle and then they're like, okay, here it goes, you know, <laughs> and we're going to challenge them and I'm going to bugle. Okay. Bugle back in there and they're, you guys are just having a bugle fest amongst each other and nobody's really closing in or, or making advancement or, you know, they could be, you know, the, pay attention to the wind. Just like Chav said, you, you never, you yeah. know, mm -hmm. a lot of yeah. times you can tell when you're calling like that, if, if it's a hunter. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I, and I think that's the biggest thing is, you know, I think some people when they hear an elk, you know, they immediately think set up, set up, set up, you know, mm -hmm. and that, that's not that's not where I'm at with it. Now, yeah, if that animal keeps coming to me and and that bull is like has made that scream, you know, that yeah. he's coming in. You know, and he's pissed, and he's challenging, and he's coming, You'll and he's coming, too, doing that. Well, that might be a little different. You'll so know it too, we're going to answer us another phone call here, guys. <laughs> so we got a caller online. Who's calling? Can you hear me? Yeah, How's we got you going? now. How are y'all? We're doing good, man. How are you doing? I'm doing all right. I appreciate y'all having. I've been grinding my tail off, man. It has been crazy. Uh, I think my fiance is ready to kill me. Uh, so, so <laughs> give us your name and where you're from. 
So, Albert Guy. I'm from uh, Paulding County, Georgia. Albert, you're one of those dudes with multiple. <laughs> yeah, I've got a couple, man. That's good. <laughs> Go dogs, huh? And, and where did you say you're from, Albert? I'm sorry? Georgia. Georgia, baby. Paulding County, Georgia. There you go. Sweet, man. Cool. Uh, Welcome we to got the a show, good twenty four hour drive across uh Colorado for our hunt. Uh, yeah, wow. you, got, you got a ways to go. Wow. We're gonna do one of them long distance drives, <laughs> BRC and and uh, Chav here pretty soon, huh? What what's your question, brother? Um, so I kind of just picked up this question earlier from uh when Mr. Keith was on the line. Uh mm-hmm. Mr. Duponche was saying he would spend a certain amount of time before he leaves that area. Mm-hmm. Um Let's say you've got sign or you got sign or you don't have sign, you know, regardless of that, how big of an area do you cover? And if you decide to move, how far do you move from that area? <laughs> That's an excellent question. Man. It's a great yeah. question. It's a really good question. Yes. Yeah. So, so I, I'll just tell you for me, man, um, when, when I'm hitting an area and I'm doing it, again, it depends on the wind, depends on a lot of variables of the area, how visible it is, um, what kind of attractions, because I'm actually going to areas, I'm looking for certain attractions. Yeah. So um, right. I, I'm wanting to find those areas that I, I really like areas that have multiple ridges that come together, almost like a crow's foot type thing i love areas where you have a solid ridge and then they have finger ridges coming down off of it so if i have something like that i'm going to hit the areas that are the animals are most likely to have to cross through right i've already hit roads like when me and cole um when we started you know scouting the area that we did in colorado all we were doing man we were in that atv and we were going down the dirt roads looking for every friggin mud hole or any place that we could see that we could find mm-hmm. track or where animals were crossing to give us any kind of visualization <clears throat> so we were covering roads first to be able to find it and then we go on the interior of it and what i really like is i like those areas where You know, what Gil was telling you about, the knuckles that I like going across the top where critters are either going to come up through the bottom of that little bit of a drain or they're going to come across the top of that ridge because that's the easier walk for them and then go from one side. Saddles of any kind of funnel saddle that goes from, you know, one south side to a north side, anything like that. I like those types of saddles like that because they are a funnel area where I can see track. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do whatever distance it takes to cover a particular area. And I would say myself, I'm probably going to hit, I don't know, the guys might say I'm lying or something, but it only seems like it's three or four miles, man. And then I'm moving. Right? So, Luis's face as he laughs. Yeah, you can go to about six or yeah, seven I can say more. The same thing. My partner would say I was lying myself. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that kind of tie. That, oh, sorry, Jojo. Uh, but I want to loop that type of area, yes, man, yes. and, you mm-hmm. know, hit those types of things so that if I loop it, because what I'm doing is I'm throwing a lasso around it. It's kind of like if you were to look at a map and you were to throw down a circle string, I'm lassoing that area because I'm finding out if anything is moving in or out of that area. If they're not, I'm done. Okay. Yeah. Joe, Joe, one of the things that we do, though, is we have A, B, C, D, yes. E, Absolutely. G yes. area. Right? But I'm going to yeah. loop my A area. and we are. It's, yeah. For sure. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But we have yeah, those say, areas that we're going to, if we need to, we yeah. pick up and move to B, right? Mm-hmm. Or we pick up, we've, we've exhausted A. You might set two groups in there, you know, and they're going to hunt and meet where they meet but at the end of the day we we really get boots on the ground and cover a lot of area quickly our first two days man it's you know i mean me and the legend covered 12 miles the first day a country just to figure out there wasn't anything there right uh so it was huge <laughs> he says a mile and a half how, how far was it? it wasn't no <laughs> mile and a half was it, one, it wasn't one, no two. mile and a half brother i can tell you that straight up and out the gate he wanted to kill me man so, so kind uh, of it's the same approach for me but i always called it the olympic rings right where i'll overlap my rings yeah. in that area it depends on that area but i think you know having your your eight a b and c are are fairly close together and as i get into my different you right. know 
planned areas that that will grow, right? If I exhaust A and B and I Olympic ring the heck out of them and I'm moved all the way to C, C is probably four and a half, five miles away. And it's a side by side or whatever, you you know, whatever I'm getting on the road and I'm making that move. How far do we go every yeah. day, guy from camp? An hour by bike, man. Yeah. It took mm-hmm. an hour by side by side. Wow, to move that here. was a, a Cadillac. <laughs> we are on the mountain Cadillac. Mountain Cadillac. But you know, in Colorado you have a different option than you have in New Mexico. Like in New Mexico, when we get a hunting unit, it might only be forty four thousand acres, man. Yeah. It might only be twenty thousand acres. So we have yeah. to work within that realm. So we're gonna break and down different there. parts of that section, right? Um I was just gonna say, uh so a lot of times like to give you an example of what a day looks like so in the mornings I typically plan my route to where I'm going to be going through the feeding areas and I'm making a route kind of up the mountain and making a loop to where I think potential bedding is going to be. Um, and every day, if I haven't found that fresh sign and all what I'm really looking for, then I might, if I do that eight mile loop that day and I didn't find anything, I'm not going back into that area tomorrow. I'm moving and maybe I park in the same spot, but I go down the mountain range and I go look down that area and I basically make a four leaf clover around where I'm camped. And if I haven't found anything, Mm -hmm. then it's time to pick up camp and move. And like in Idaho last year, I'm, I picked up and moved camp on opening day. I drove a hundred miles South in the same unit and then ended up getting into elk sign that next day and killed a bull that evening. Um, you know, if, it, if you're not seeing that fresh sign or the, the amount of sign that you need, um, you've, yeah, I think so many guys get hung up on beautiful country and it's just not elk country, you know? Luis yeah. Manano, you guys two got you are two guys that when we send you into an area, you don't. T- I mean, there's nothing that's left unturned. These guys are unbelievable uh, mountain climbers. I don't like to climb mountains. I like to elk hunt. But at the end of the day, these guys are mountain climbers, man. And what helps you guys get in there and find elk or not find elk immediately? What do you guys look for? They go Sign. where I tell them to go first of all. <laughs> yeah, I didn't. I, no doubt, Joe sets the pecking order where we're gonna go. There is no doubt about that. A, B, C, D, E. Or, but these guys have an innate ability to get in there and find elk early, right? They, so it's uh it's uncanny how well they do when they're together. So is there a dynamic that you guys use, Luis? Well, we, we, we argue most of the, the way. Time. Yeah. That's, and use that's, the how we're, and, uh, yeah. that's how we're strategy. So. Yeah, and then I tell Manana to go and, and take a dump, and then I get ready because the elk are going to be coming in <laughs> while he's truth. taking a dump. Um, that's the truth. No, I think, I think <laughs> you know, we, we, do, we do have a conversation the night prior. We right. kind of analyze, okay, how are we going to divide? How are we going to conquer? Uh, which areas are, gonna, are we going to be looking at? And then, you know, based on the area that, you know, it's assigned to us, then when I don't, I will sit down. I was like, okay, well, how's the wind, you know, now, um, the Onyx has, has that, that wind, uh, yeah, yeah. portion in the app and it's great. I mean, it's, it's an amazing it's, tool and it's pretty accurate on is very accurate. So that helps us a lot too, to understand where we're going to tackle from. Right. And, uh, which direction predominantly the wind is blowing. Um, and then, uh, start looking, looking for sign, looking for sign. And then, um, we, we will walk very quietly. We're not going to be walking very fast. We're going to be walking quietly. Um, and we'll stop every once in a while and then throw a few calls, listen Mm -hmm. for a little bit and continue walking. Um, are you in a little bit and then the, yeah. Yeah. (laughs) So, so, I mean, we just, we take our time, but we're consistent as far Moving. as the pace in which yeah. we move and what which we stop. And then, you know, we give well, a lot of importance to the listening as well. And then if, if look, if we're just walking areas, we're tr- the whole time we're walking, we're tracking um, all our trajectory on Onyx. 
that way we understand and we're you know we're able to mark where we see things or where we find stuff so we feel like we're actually building a report so when we come back to camp we can share that report with the team a lot better and then just Mm -hmm. give people better intel so we can put all our heads together and then you know come 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 back with plan b for the next day mapping Right. I was trying to pull 520 yeah. up, 21 up on my screen there, but you can't really see it. But that, and, and Joe <clears throat> kind of alluded to it, right? New Mexico having smaller <clears throat> units. 521 is a massive unit, it right? Is. So if you don't it have is. your A, B, it C, is. and D kind of picked out going into a unit that size, it it, it's going to be a little bit of struggle, right? It, yeah. it is going to swallow you. So that would be one of my things. And brother, man, if you want to DM me, I, I opened that thing up and looked at 521 and I'm like, oh, first spot I went to. So I'll shoot you where I think they're at. <laughs> just shoot that over to me. Too. I mean, we we have Dude. we spent so much time last year just scouting the entire state and trying to just figure out where we should go. Uh, last year was our first year, uh, and by I mean I'm just going to say this by chance. We had came down to a lower plateau and we were cow partying down there, and uh, it's a little after midday, uh, and we ended up getting busted by two cows, man. And, I've been bugged out since. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to El uh, Yeah, man. But, hey, <laughs> all, that whi- all that effort and it'll whip you. All that effort and it'll whip you. Yeah, yeah. Busted busted again, you guys, Josie. That's you guys were doing the scenario and you called him in, so you're doing something right. So that's yeah, step right. one right there. Him. So, yes, sir. yeah, hundred percent. And, yeah. and just after that, we got caught in a hailstorm. So that should tell you that. to slow down, man. You guys are probably moving too quick, you know, slow down and let that stuff marinate, you know, especially on the, on the heels of a storm, man, be, be methodical and let those calls marinate, you know, and, uh, they, they'll show themselves, man. Was it early season too? Uh, we got there about the 13th. So it was, oh, it was your prime time. Season, so yeah, man. Uh, yeah. so like we're going to get out there early this year, uh, probably around the 28th and get some boots on the ground and, mm-hmm. and kind of go from there. I got some new spots I want to check out. Uh, but I think we're going to zone back into where we were. I mean, the elk were there. We smelled them. Uh, there was a huge wallow that was torn up and there was a, a nice spring wallow as well. Uh, both of them within a hundred yards of each other. Yeah, no, if, you know, it sounds to me like you're doing the right thing. It sounds like you're in out, yeah. you know. Yeah. Um, so, I, you know, there's really no reason for you to pull up. And, and I'll tell you something, too, like when you heard, like, how far to go. You know, one of the reasons Cole went 100 yards was Cole had recon that, you know, miles. and did some intel that, you know, he used to go that that hundred miles, man. Um, mm-hmm. and, and so don't be afraid to do that as well. You know, you come across people, have conversations, you know, um, uh, absolutely. Yeah. We met some of the best. Yeah, we moved our camp two there. hours. Absolutely. You I will, man. You. And, and don't forget local restaurants. Um, you know, even asking people talking about, man, I, I'm worried about hitting an animal at night. You know, <laughs> uh, I've had some elk hit the road and people will tell you, man, you got to watch out for this section, that section and stuff like that. Just little things like that are just Intel that tell you different things, man. But you're in elk, bud. Um, yeah. all you got to do is just keep working the game. Yeah. Yeah. Best of luck. Well, I appreciate you guys answering my question. You bet, yeah, you bet you, bud. Thank you have gone in. Yeah, keep grinding, man. In, we'll, we'll, and good luck on that uh, giveaway. Thank you, sir. All right, take care, man. Camp. <clears throat> yeah, and, and I hear that from so many people. They're like, you know, when and why do I pull up, you know? Well, I tell you what, one thing I've heard people say, I stayed seven days in an area and I never saw an elk. Oh, we got another caller coming in, y'all. Sweet. Okay, this is caller number three. How you doing? Oh, uh, hey, uh, how y'all doing? Uh, I just wanted to say I've been a longtime supporter of the Elk Bros. I've been uh, watching your show. I, and I uh, had an opportunity to get on your website this week to register for the 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 Basic Elk Hunting Academy. Yes, sir. <laughs> and, 
it's I wanted to get some additional entries into it, but I was wanting to know when on your on the store page. Yes, sir. When you guys were gonna have the Cole Wilkes uh, Daisy Dukes you know, available is- and the guys <laughs> long day, and then guys long day, uh, leg warmers oh, when you're in the quakies and it's a little It's gotta cold. be Eric Aragon, man. <laughs> <laughs> I knew something was up on this. This gotta be Eric Aragon, though. <laughs> I, I don't know who it was. He just hung Dude, up on us, man. Runner, and, man. And, you, and you know what? It's a shame because today's caller that was going to win, that number was caller number three. Number <laughs> three. Sorry, bud. I want to yeah. just. So, a- so well, he won. He won. So, so he wow, we don't, we don't have a team. name in a place, man. He won't call, call, so. call, we call back. Wait, yeah. hold on, Cole. Stand up. We gotta, we gotta do the trouser check, brother. <laughs> <laughs> you best to have some diagonal pants on. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we have a, we have a caller coming in. This will be, yo. This is, uh, you're on with, uh, with the Elk Bros, man. Who we got? Hey, this is Jonathan. <laughs> hey, hey, Jonathan. Jonathan. Oh, wait a second, up, guys. Man? We have. Hunt Winner. Wars royalty on here, man. Oh, wow. Awesome. Nice. Jonathan Scott. Hey, how's it going? It's going good, man. How are you doing, bud? Hey, doing real good. Hey, hey, Cole, you, 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 do you know this guy? Oh, you dang right. <laughs> <laughs> the reason that I killed my bull in Idaho. So, Mr. Scott here is proof positive that... You can come into a, an elk season and really not – how much how much calling had you guys done prior to coming on to Hunt Wars, Jonathan? I had done none. Zero. <laughs> none. Uh, yeah, absolutely zero. <laughs> and how many elk had you ever hunted with a bow, Jonathan? I had never hunted anything with a bow. So I got my first wow. bow from Hunt Wars. <laughs> wow you got your first elk on hunt wars got his first elk on hunt yeah. wars and first ta- elk and my yeah and first bow so g- give your partner a shout out to everybody who's listening to this yeah so uh i took brent howie with me and he had done very little elk hunting uh with his uh dad and grandfather and uh but definitely hadn't been calling and, and those kinds of things so we kind of came into it very uh very much rookies and you know and just came in with an open mind and ready to learn everything we possibly could and and it was awesome that so they went through they went through the two months of training with uh with the elk bros and then they had you know they had cole and and that redneck aragon in camp with them (laughs) Uh, and and i tell you man i couldn't have been any prouder that uh, we had two fellows that came in that all they did was they worked and learned and listened, um, took the playbook, applied it on their first ever elk hunt, and, and came it. out the winners of the hunt wars. So, so cool. um, yeah. was this last season or 21? So that yeah, was 21. Uh, yeah, 21. 21. 21. Yeah. yeah. I don't know, Jonathan. I've got to say, I mean, if I would have ever done something like that, that would have ruined me. I would have just stopped elk hunting at that point and just Done. move on to, you know, something else, man. Now, you, I'll tell you, you, it ruined me in the right way because now yeah. all I hunt is elk, and now I listen to is elk, and yeah. you know, living, living. very cool. And and I think Brent took his skill set. Um, and and I tell you, man, uh, again, Brent had never had a diaphragm in his mouth, and it was work in progress. And these guys just went and ran the playbook, and then they, after Hunt Wars, they went and just started, you know, taking their skill set and still continue to hunt elk and do good things, right? That's so awesome. Yeah, yeah so uh, we got one elk down last year um, outside of Hunt Wars, so two, two years in a row. Yeah. So. How about wow. that? Make it three. Wow. Mm-hmm. We're, we're going well. to have to give him the Manano Award, man. You know, he's like yeah. <laughs> consistent, man. Yeah, because no I I think uh, uh, I think Manano, except for last year, because Manano was you were a hundred percent for three years, weren't you? Yeah, yeah. in a row. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah. He's on so, the down corner, me. 
<laughs> hey, we got John Waldron on uh, listening up here too. So, do you have a question for us, man? Yeah, I do. So, <clears throat> the biggest question that's been going through my mind is so I'm hunting in Idaho it's over the counter. I can pick anywhere throughout the state to go hunt. Um, I'm fortunate enough that way. And, um, and so I have a place that's good that we're really learning the units and know, you know, the elk patterns and, and really figuring out kind of where to go, where to be and, and that kind of thing. And looking at statistics and, and whatnot, there's, there are other units that are, you know, having higher bull harvest in, uh, you know, during archery season. Mm -hmm. And so my, my question is, is with the, with the major change of weather, um, you know, more snowfall, the other place I'm looking at is a much higher elevation than where we've currently been hunting. And so I'm, my question is, is with the weather and having so much more snowfall, do you feel that that will change the elk patterns as far as getting back up to that high country? Um, or, you know, kind of like within my mind is, you know, the elk live in the weather, you know, it, it's harsh weather for us, you know, during the season, you know, they're going to still do what they do because they live in it. Yeah, no, that that snow, especially in the amount that you guys had. What do you think, RC? Oh yeah, they're gonna head down. Yeah, yeah, they're, they're absolutely gonna gonna change that. And there's another thing that's gonna happen. You guys got so much moisture that they're not gonna be mm -hmm. condensed either. They're gonna be really spread out. You know, uh, there's gonna be water everywhere. Right. Creeks are gonna be running everywhere. There's gonna be, you know, a mm -hmm. lot of wet stuff. So. Um, you're going to want to find where that snow is melting, that grass starts coming up. You find that green grass line belt, you know, um, where those cows are feeding, and really pay attention. Don't really worry now about, you know, so much the the bulls where they're going to be in the summertime. Are you, are you hunting earlier? Are you hunting later season? Um, I'm, I'm splitting it up, and I'm kind of going three different times for – five days or so at a time mm -hmm. so throughout the season first week third week fourth week yeah yeah so it, it's really going to be where where that grass is showing up and it's going to be a lot of green in that country there's going to be a lot of feed so this animals mm -hmm. are not going to have to congregate as much right and you know mm -hmm. if if you if you are hunting areas that you hunted before that you've had cows and you've had bulls rutting in those areas and i would I would not necessarily say that they're going to be, you know, those big high areas. It depends on how long it takes for that snow to melt. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It might be that mid-level, yeah. man. Um, yeah. The, mm -hmm. you know, the other thing to think about, too, is is where the predators, where the bears are going to be gathering most. Because I think, you know, um, mm -hmm. they're, they're going to be hitting a lot of that snow line and that grass. They're going to be doing some of the same things, hoping to... You know, like uh, when these animals drop here in July and stuff like that. So um, that's going to have an effect on the animals, move things around a little bit. But y'all have wolves. Yeah, I I, I, I think know. yeah, yeah wolves and grizzly bears. Yep, but your snow is definitely going to have an effect on them. And wherever you have really that grass and that feed going, where those um where those cows can still drop calves and mm -hmm. have easy yep. raising of them, that's going to be areas that. Um, between there and where those bulls end up summering, you know, it probably isn't going to be as high up there if that snow lingers right. long enough. It's kind of like what mm -hmm. we talked about earlier, too, is if uh, you're up there and you go into the Dairy Queen and you're having a big old burger and there's somebody in there and just drop a hint and say, hey, you know, what do these out do when it snows real hard up on the high country? Mm -hmm. If he's a native, he's going to tell you, well, they come storming off that hill, or the, he's going to let you know, and you just kind of have to feel it out. Yeah. I, I'd really yeah. search out the old timers because the type yeah. of snow that you guys had is the type of snows that we used to used to have, right, before things yeah. got really dry yeah. and we had all the fires. So some of those old timers that have dealt with that kind of snow in the past are the guys to really, really listen to. If you I want a lot of recon. It, it, now, I don't know. Did we answer your question? Did we help you out with that? 
Yeah, it, it, it's just that it's the challenge of do we do we change units and go up higher or kind of stay where we know the elk are? I'm staying um, where I know I don't the elk leave elk to find mm-hmm. elk, brother. And, yeah. and, and then get a, grab a farm, farmer's almanac, right? And you can look at you can look at previous year snowfall, <laughs> rainfall, things like that, and utilize that resource as well, right? Get on get on uh, mm-hmm. Idaho Fish and Game and look at the look at the yeah. numbers that they're posted. Look at those uh, and see how that's varying through those seasons as you're into that almanac. The almanac tell you a whole lot, man. Yeah, you start comparing that's those. Good idea. Mm-hmm. I like that. Nothing but, but, beats you knowing that country, though. No, like no, 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 no. You could take a crappy, crappy unit, and just you knowing it like the back of your hand turns mm-hmm. it into a really good unit because you know everywhere not to go. Mm-hmm. That's Yeah, that's, that's the big benefit. thing. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> the thing about where to go is where not to go. That's yeah. right, Cole. Yeah. And, and if if you have areas that you have seen elk before and you go in there and they're not quite there yet – Okay, so how have they been affected by that weather pattern? They're they're going to be there eventually. So are they a little lower? Are they a little higher? Are they over, you know, in the next valley where it's a little more protected? You know, they're going to eventually be there because they've been there before. They like that area, right? There's something that's attracting them to yep. that area. So yep. um, I would definitely go where I've been, where I have found elk, and know that, you know, I might have to make a little bit of an adjustment there, but those elk are there. Yeah, and if you don't find them there, then plan B. Yep. Get up high and see what you find, you know? Absolutely, and man. Yeah. They're, they're probably not going to have to move as much this year with the feed being as good as it, as it is. If they don't get bumped out of an area and they have everything they need, expect those bulls to be in those remoter areas where they're not getting pressured that early season um, until, you know, until the party really starts. Yeah, buddy. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. and and because you're going early and then you're, you know, going some other days, you're definitely going to see a, you know, you're going to get a feel for where those animals are. And I tell you what, like Cole saying, when you find those animals early, where those cows are, they're not going to be because of the amount of feed and because of the amount of moisture, they're not going to move that far. Right. You yeah. know, those bulls yeah. will those bulls will try to rut them in the same areas that they rutted them previously. And, mm-hmm. you know, they actually pick the areas because the cows like those areas for where they're at. Well, awesome. Thank you very much. You bet, you bet, man. I, I, I want to wish you all the best of luck. I, I, I you know, um, who knows, man, you've already won one giveaway. We might be seeing you in New Mexico, <laughs> man. So you might oh, have to man, make other man, plans on the early great. season. <laughs> That, that's why I'm planning multiple weeks. So, <laughs> <laughs> I tell you what, it'd be a it'd be an honor to have you in camp, bro. Definitely. You might as well just take the whole yeah. month, brother. You only have one week that's hanging on to work anyway. <laughs> I know it. I I work remote, so it makes it it makes it hard, you know, because it's like okay, I can go out early morning, and then if I jump on calls, <laughs> and then I can hunt the evening, you know. Yeah, it makes it it makes it really tough. <laughs> yeah. Best of luck, man. Stay in touch. I know you will. Yes, sir. Yeah, sounds good. Take Thanks, care buddy. there, Jonathan. Here we go. What if there was a way to flatten your elk hunting learning curve and have the experience of a lifetime, gaining decades of elk hunting knowledge and skill sets that'll take your DIY confidence and ability to a whole new level? Look no further. Welcome to Elk Bros Adventures in our coached adventure camp, an elk hunting experience like no other. Your prep and training starts months before you ever step foot on the mountain. Our campers have weekly online training sessions with each member of our Elk Pro Success Squad in all aspects of the hunt. Gear, physical conditioning, archery setup, failure points to avoid, shooting proficiency, finding elk, locating, behavior calling, setup, and closing the deal. From the moment you get to elk camp, the boots on the ground training begins. Each camper will have one of the Elk Rose trained coaches with them throughout the hunt, not guiding, but teaching and helping you to learn and apply those lessons. For the price of what many today are paying for tags alone, 
you will be smashing that DIY learning curve, becoming a more knowledgeable, capable, effective, confident, and therefore successful DIY elk hunter. Y'all, hunt preparation like no other, a learning experience like no other, an elk hunting adventure like no other. For more information, go to elkbros.com forward slash hunt. That's elkbros.com forward slash hunt. Flattening that learning curve, now there is a way. Well, cheers to the elk bros, huh? Cheers. 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 A great elk hunt. Yes, sir. I, I tell you what, man, uh, of all the am amount of people and different names that I've seen applying for our hunt, uh, it's so exciting to have it, uh, so many people. Um, it's so exciting to see people that are wanting to come in and hunt with us and tell you what, it's going to be an honor to spend some time with any of those folks. So uh, best of luck to everybody that's yep. in that giveaway, man. Absolutely. Um, so let's do this, man. Um, we Until we get a call that interrupts us, we do have a mailbox question in here from Bill Steiger from Oregon. Okay. Um, <clears throat> He says, a lot of your podcasts, especially the later episodes, you often talk about some different sounds, language like roundup bugle, regathering mew, lost cow, demanding mew, etc. It would be great if you could demonstrate the sounds. Could be an episode all to itself. And you're right, it could. Okay. And we've done some of this. But we've got a group of callers on here right now. Um, mm -hmm. that uh, we'd be able to probably help do some of this stuff and talk about not only what they, you know, do in the sound, but why we do the sound on some of those things. He says that he's going through the blue collar training camp um, and some of the sounds are talked about, but not, not all of them. And we're working on that for you too as well. I listened to your podcast, episode 143, Archery Elk Hunting Game Changers with Guy Duplanche, and it was an aha moment when Guy described how when he broke up the herd and used a regathering mew to pull that bull in. That was an awesome example. This is so powerful and great learning moment for me. Look forward to your future content. All right? So... First of all, I know that he listened to that and he talked to me and we have other people that might be hearing this. Let's talk in, you know, he said regathering mew. That demanding mew yeah. that you talk about later is pretty much a, a lot like that or is Lost that cousin. regathering well, it's mew? The, it's the yes. emphasis on that regathering mew yes. or any, any vocalization yes. in elk world, right? Yes. That, that emphasis on the end of that cow call, right? The emphasis and the cadence that it comes, it's that yearning the way, hey, where'd everybody go? Y'all get over here, right? I mean, uh, it's definitely that that difference, you know? So I bet you, I bet you he's making the sounds. I've done this. I'm making the sounds and don't even realize I'm making the sounds because I'm thinking about what the sound is as I'm trying to put emphasis on it. And then there it is, right? We, yeah. we get caught up in the names of the sound and it's like, man, you're, you're doing it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> it, just think about emotions. It's the same way. You know, if, if I'm making a sound and I'm like, Hey guy, come here. And guy doesn't hear me. And I don't know where he's at. Guy, guy. You know, I'm starting to get more demanding. I'm getting Frantic. a little longer. I'm pleading more when I do it. And those types of things, that's where you get your lost cow. It's the same thing. He's going, mm -hmm. that cow's going through the woods and it's going longer on there because it's, you know, it's yeah. lost and it's trying, yeah. hey, you guys out there, right? Yeah. Um, and same thing with that regathering mew. I think there's a lot of those long, insistent mews that you could do and like guy said um it doesn't have to necessarily be the exact correct thing that another animal does but they understand that insistence they understand mm -hmm. that pleading and they hear that i had a uh, a guy one of the kids that i've been coaching that's been guiding and he he calls me up from the mountain and he's like coach he said I've done everything elk bros on these on these bulls and they're not coming in. I said, You've done everything elk bros, man. <laughs> <laughs> Threw the book at him. So I, I said, I want you to do me a favor. The next time you have your hunter and you got that bull out there, and because he's saying they're just standing out there talking, they're not coming into us. I said, I want you to once you have your hunter in place, I want you to go away and I just want you, yeah, 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 as you're going away. 
tell me what happens. And he sends mm -hmm. me a text, man, later on. He goes, gold. It was gold. I didn't call in one. I called in four bulls. You know? So, yeah. yeah. It's really the Cadillac for us. And um, I can tell you, you know, the regathering is, is so close to the lost cow call, right? Anyway, because, you know, and you can stop the whole herd you know, mm -hmm. uh, with that regathering you, but it's, it's insistent, man. You know, it's an insistent. And like Joe said, it's like me saying, Hey guy, how's it going? And then I'm lost and I can't find guy. And I'm like, guy, where are you at? You know I mean? It's the Why? same thing. Wait a minute. Hold on. You're the one who got lost. I should be hollering Gil. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so what we'll do, what we'll do for Bill is we're going to get a set. We're going to get a session where we come in and we talk about these and we're going to do some of these different calls. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. We'll get a session where we do that. Um, and so these guys can hear some of it and why we're doing them, you know, what the loss, because when you do the regathering you, one's just higher to lower one's lower to higher. That's all it is. Just a little bit different. That lost cow or lost calf, you know, um, uh, we'll work on those and mm -hmm. try to do that. There, anytime you hear like a roundup bugle versus a roundup bugle is, is just a shorter type sure, bugle, man. man. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's just telling those cows, man, hey, let's get together. You know, it's doing that one, 1 1.5 second bugle instead of doing that one, that, that location bugle that is going out mm -hmm. longer out there. You know, so it's, it's about, it's about um, emotion and length, basically. Joe, can I can I also say on that, right, since he brought up 143, and I, I want to be clear, with, if I remember the conversation you and I had, you, you got to remember the scenario you're in, right? The elk are going to dictate. When you're when you're throwing up that roundup bugle or that regathering mew, you have information that you've gathered from them, and now you're responding to that information. We're not going to just go and start throwing a regathering mew at mm -hmm. a herd that's together and nothing's going on, right? Wow. We knew the herd was busted That'll up. Alarm them. And then, you know, we, we're trying to bring them back in. We saw something, got our information, and then went into language. It's it's the same thing as if you go in and you bust up a flock of turkeys, yep. you know. And that's what Guy recognized. He had a situation that the animals blew up. They went out into different situations. And what happens a lot of times is elk will run up. They'll go on the side of a ridge. They'll turn broad side they'll wait the ears are up and they're listening to see okay i just ran for my life where's everybody else at you know yeah. and then that lead yeah. cow takes over and she starts calling them back <laughs> into her and look it's going to work for bulls it's going to work for calves it's going to work for cows because those bulls mm -hmm. have heard that ever since they were young right yeah. so it absolutely has an effect on there hey we, we've got to do something here real quick, man. Um, I, I want to remind everybody, uh, if you leave us a review on op Apple Podcasts or on, comment on our YouTube channel where you give us your name and where you're from in that, um, it won't be this week. Next time we record, because we're going to do it every month, we've already done one. We're going to throw all those names into a hat each <coughs> month and draw a winner for both the Wapiti River and Signature Elk Bros Diaphragm Call. So our, our last one, uh, we've already had one winner. Casey Gamble won that last week. we got some stuff going out to him. So, you guys, we appreciate um, all of those reviews and comments you leave. Keep it up, man. Okay. It's another way we can give back. That's all. Yes, sir. We had a bunch of people that gave shout outs. Let's give shout outs to our this week's top listening cities. Luis, will you start us off, dude? This week's top listening city got its name from the nearby Sassafras. 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 Or spiced wood <laughs> timber that grew well in the area. It is located <laughs> along the banks of Lake Travis and offers an abundance of outdoor recreational activities. Home to country music legend, and a shout out to our man, Willie Nelson, Spicewood, Texas. Spicewood, Texas. Spicewood, Texas. Yeah! The home <laughs> of Willie Nelson. About 35 not miles from me. Not too far from Brother Wilkes. That's right, man. Yep. Oh, sure. really, across huh? Across the river. Yeah, yeah right, across, uh, right across Lake Travis from he me. He might be 35, 40 miles from from uh, as the crow flies for sure yeah. uh man that's Good awesome man. what what a cool name man and uh i don't know if you guys and you don't know what sassafras is luis yes nope. it's a tree yeah. and they use the Sass bark to make use sassafras it's, tea. yeah it's a root the... actually yeah, yeah and, mm -hmm. um you can Leaves actually too. 
put it in, make uh, tea with it and different things. You can actually use a root as a toothbrush, and it has yep. a lot of cool. I guess it's like spice wood. <laughs> no. Yes, you could say that. Kind of. <laughs> spice wrong. You. That or kind of gave it away. Yeah, or. <laughs> hey, Manano, I think there's a beach at this next place. Oh, that's a hardest one. Well, I'll, I'll I'll do my best. Let's stop. This city was named after Prosperous City in Kansas, and it's known for its unique corn. The corn is renowned for its extra sugary flavor, delicate texture, and succulent succulent taste, and grown only here. Agriculturalists attri attribute to it its high elevation, mountain spring irrigation, and its position in the Joe, please. On compadre. On, on, on compadre. On compadre. On compadre. The only word that I know is compadre in Spanish. Not, no. <laughs> <laughs> you can't even <laughs> pronounce it right. Yeah. On compadre valley. Hola, hola de, hola da, Colorado. Olaza, <laughs> Colorado. And, and I think we've had um, we've had Ola the on before, but I think it was in Kansas no, or another we, state. We we don't have one in Kansas before. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, we may we may be able to teach Manano how to so, call in an elk before we can teach him how to read. <laughs> <laughs> guys are horrible. You're so bad, man. Uh. <laughs> Oh, that's I'm right. Proud. That's right. <laughs> well, Chav's not here right now, so I'll take his. This city was originally named Fairbanks in the 1820s. Uh, a boundary <laughs> dispute between the United States and... Oh, there he is. <laughs> he, covered, he didn't even know he covered his... his what were you doing, Kubez? I covered that with his camera. camera. He's like... The, the ninja. The ninja. The ninja, the ninja, ninja, ninja comes back. He, he pulled it off and he was so surprised. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Chad, that was awesome. Yeah, I was like, I'm not there. I'm not there. <laughs> oh, that was great. Okay, uh, this next city was originally named Fairbanks in the 1820s. A boundary dispute between the United States and Canada led to the Aroostook War, which eventually led to a name change. Its new name comes from the French term for a peninsula. It is now a hub for winter and outdoor sports, and this is in Presque Isle, Maine. <laughs> Presque Isle, Maine. Oh, okay. Presque Isle, Maine. Maine. Maine and look at this. So we're at uh, Texas, Colorado, Maine. That's that's our and Chav. How can you act like um, you haven't seen any of that stuff when you type all this up? Man? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think I was going to get this one. So. <laughs> that's so big, big O. Big O's in the house. And look, this next city, this next city, R.C. Knox endorsed it, right? It's the largest <laughs> retirement community in the world with a population of well over 130,000 people, man. It's home to the largest and most diverse single site golf facility in the world with over 50 championship and executive golf courses. It's also Whoa. known as Boomer Paradise. And I'm not talking about Norman Oklahoma either. I'm talking about the villages in Florida. Florida, the villages. The village. Florida. Yes, sir, in Florida. So that was a part of RC. From Maine to Florida. Look at here, Joe. We got it from the very top to the very bottom. <laughs> what, what, what about it did you endorse, RC? <laughs> the retired community, I was babe. Say, I'm calling BS on that one. <laughs> Where we're at right now, I really don't want to dive into this. Maybe I'll do one of these questions so that we can kind of take ourselves to where we're going to go next time. All right. And sure. I'll read this off and uh, we'll get this started. And, uh, and then we'll continue when we come on the next one because, man, this is awesome. The, the main topic for our show that we were going to do besides the call-ins um, actually comes from an incredible set of questions from one of our listeners. Don Anderson in Seattle, Washington, sent in, and he said, I can't tell you how much I appreciate your show. I have become a loyal listener, and even after hunting elk for several years, I've learned so much. I actually have a multiple-part question I have multiple part questions and totally understand if you only want to answer one or two because he had a list there, man. But <laughs> they're good. 
Shop but there's some things. good stuff on here. Yeah, but I've yeah. been writing these down as I listen and thought that there'd be other hunters with the same questions. So the, we're going to start with number one, and I'm going to go around because um, I, I'm going to let Travis actually start off with this one uh, and see what he has to say. He says, Travis, he says, um, first of all, how do you decide between moving and calling or setting up and doing a scenario? Uh, so me personally, I like, I'm very patient. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm probably unlike more, most people out there. Um, but I like to, I like to do scenarios. And so I like to just sit and be patient and do scenarios. Um, there are times where if I'm just scouting and hunting along, I will just kind of move along and, and call and work, work my way somewhere. But for the most part, I like to, to do scenarios. So I'm, calling from one spot and when i when you do the scenarios i'm literally doing a couple minutes of calling and then i'll wait 15 20 minutes and then i'll do some more calling wait another 15 20 minutes do that scenario all over again and i like to honestly wait probably a good hour and then that's if nothing's happening that's when i'll decide to move now now travis let's the other thing i think we need to do is include some information with that because you're definitely targeting some areas aren't you <clears throat> yeah for for the most part I'm, I'm one of the lucky ones i can actually scout all summer and i know my areas and they're the same areas that i hunt all the time kind of thing i do mix in one or two new areas every year um just try to find new ground new elk you know something else to play with so you know the elk uh, are supposed the to be there part, anyway uh, yeah yeah i know where, where they're gonna be like roughly mm -hmm. they can be a couple miles either way right. and not even in a lot of places they'll be they'll be you know a mile at the most kind of thing so but that's where your scouting comes in and i understand like a lot of people have to drive long ways to get to where they are uh, i'm just saying that's where i'm pretty lucky i can drive out in an evening do some scouting and if nothing's there i can try a different spot you know uh i'll bump up down the road a couple miles and and be bought back up into the hills somewhere um, but for the most part, I'm, I'm scouting before time. And then when I'm going in in the morning, like you say, Joe, I'm, I'm targeting cause I know these fresh elk tracks went in somewhere and I'm targeting those, those elk for the most part. Um, but yeah, so it's a little bit easier on my, on my end and but you know, that's the, you know how the mountains so that, That's the key though, mm -hmm. Travis, right? You're, you're mm -hmm. doing a setup when you see that super fresh. You're yeah. not necessarily setting up when you're just, you haven't seen anything. Yeah. That's when you're moving and calling, right? Yeah, the, that's type right. Of, the type yeah. of information yeah. you have yeah. can dictate what, dictates, gonna do yeah. what, what you're going to be doing. Uh, because absolutely. because if you if if you know it's an area where they're at, or you probably put them to bed the night before and you're coming back next morning. Yeah. And, and so, I mean, you got a plan in place and, and, and you'll do a scenario, but when, when you're finding them, when you're looking for them, um, you're, mm -hmm. you're, you're walking and calling and, and looking yeah. because you don't know, you may not know the area, right? I mean, you're yeah. just coming in new to a public land. So, I mean, the type of information you have on the elk, I think dictates uh, what to do in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and, and I, I've been with Joe a thousand times where we walk into an area, <clears throat> and it's dark, man. It's it's mm -hmm. getting to where it's getting to that dark transition of gray light early morning, and you know Joe Joe's going to cast out something to see if we can get an answer, right? So it's just a really light cow call, you know. He'll, he'll put his diaphragm in, and a lot of times he'll use his bugle tube too. I don't have mine here with me, but he'll cast that cow call out just, it and it'll, it'll go, yeah, there you go, baby. <laughs> yeah, He's there right. you go. <laughs> I know somebody that's got one that can hook me up, uh, but I mean, he, he really will. He'll just put his diaphragm in and really literally just cast out a cow call, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Being uh, one or two calls like that and we just sit. And it, you, yeah. you can't be rustling in your bag and <laughs> all that stuff. It's so important to listen because mm -hmm. man, you so many times we've done that and we're super silent and then you hear a bull in a distance. 
Well, that tells me now I got to cut the distance, right? That bull's mm-hmm. four or 500 yards away. Now we're going in there, right? We're going to get inside that bubble, test his temperature. Then we decide we're going to set our scenario up, right? But as far as just walking through the woods, casting calls about and stuff, we do that, but there's a method to that madness when we're, mm-hmm. when we're even, I call it hunt scouting, you know, and uh, we're moving through an area, but I, I love the early morning time where it's not even really good daylight. It's kind of gr- what Joe calls gray light. And man, if you can get an answer, that just sets your whole day on fire, yeah. right? I mean, now you got something to go work with, right? And there's a lot of times, I mean, I, I got to hunt uh, uh, recently a couple years back with Joe, and it was just me and him on opening day. And I mean, I, we walk, what, Joe out of camp, maybe 150 yards and seriously 150 200 yards and joe goes yeah yeah and i mean it's like where do you want to go yeah (laughs) it's like oh man it's on like donkey kong awesome uh so yeah that's what you want and it those days you live for but sometimes Mm -hmm. you got to put in two or three miles and before that happens you know yeah yeah and and when you have when we have something like that when we get something that sounds off you know, depending, it's early in the morning, it's just gray light, that means we can cut the distance, that means we can get in close, we most likely can work that bull because of the time of day it is, um, or getting ourselves in a position to be able to follow that bull up and maybe harass it or get into it when it's in its bed later. You know, if if it's a situation where it's a little later and he's talking to me from up on the hill and he's heading up already, things have got to change like that. Now I'm actually going to a situation where we're probably following until he beds down and then we're scenario time. We're going to actually mm-hmm. wait on that situation. Or if we've got an animal that is coming from, because I really like to work in that transition from those feed areas to those bed areas. I like to be in that mid range when they're coming from the bottom because I don't wanna be chasing so much, right? And that gives me an opportunity basically to angle into them, um, to, to make some decisions, to find out, you know, if that if that animal's going with cows or if that animal's in search if he's advertising and just trying to figure out what the variables are and then make a decision on what i'm doing there if i figure out that it's a bull that's advertising man it's not going to take much of a scenario especially if he's responding to cow (coughs) calls if he's responding to cow calls every time that i do it and every time that he's sounded off he's closer i don't have to worry about a scenario i'm setting up i'm getting ready to kill a bull right Mm -hmm. But, but if I'm in a situation where that booger's bedded up on the side of the hill and he's doing that bed bugling up there and he's staying put up there, well, now it's a different situation. Now I'm going to do something where I'm going to get myself at that level. I'm going to get myself in a situation where I make it easy for him to come to me. And I'm going to wait a little bit, let him get a little bit rested, have made a few noises to let him know I'm in the area. And then we're going to set up and we're going to do us a scenario, man. Yeah. You know, I'm going to try to make it sound like a cow, maybe a bull that's over there with that cow maybe it's a type of breeding sequence that i'm in there and i and when i say a bull doing it i don't like to when i get in that situation sound off i don't want another bull to to know how big i am as a bull i'm going to use those low Mm -hmm. vocal type things i'm going to use the raking i'm going to use a little bit of huffing you know that type of stuff to be able yeah so that that bull can't gauge is going to come in there right yeah um Especially if he's just bed bugling from the side, is that a bull that went with cows that at one time I could tell it was a mature bull or is that a set satellite that's bed bugling on the side of that hill? There's so many decisions you have to make right in Your there. wind too, man, especially in those, as yeah. it starts warming through the day, those thermals really start mm-hmm. acting up and, and your wind can swirl. Even the first thing in the morning, would, you know, if the wind's swirling and you just can't get it right, well, it's really hard to make a decision on what we're mm-hmm. going to go do because the wind just won't let you do anything, right? The more you move, the worse the wind gets, and you're trying to hunt into the wind or side wind, right, parallel in the wind. But, you know, the wind plays a huge difference in how we set up, if we can even go chase down a bull or anything like that. So the wind's a very important part. Well, of you take that situation Gilbert's talking about. Let's say that yeah. I went up and I followed a and the wind started getting crazy because we had a you, you know how the the sun you know those day storms start to come over and things go one way and then they go the other i'm actually bailing 
I've got mm-hmm. that bull. I've already got him marked on my GPS. I'm bailing over a ridge to get to the other side the of side. that. Yep. And I'm waiting till that day calms down. And then yeah. now I'm going to go back up and reset, and I'm going to do me a scenario to pull. Because I know that bull's there. He's not going anywhere. He's going to be there all that time. You know, if he has yeah. cows with him, he's especially going to be there as long as they're bedded. They might get up and feed a little bit, but they're not really going that far, right? Unless That's, they're going to chow's yeah. blind where there's water, you know, yeah. <laughs> something like that. that yeah. That's, but that's yeah, one, that's one time, Joe, where you, you would leave an elk to go find another elk. Absolutely, because you're yeah, gonna bust right. him out, right? Yeah, so. yeah, I don't want to bust him out, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, if I have a bad, I've even like you know we talk about how you know we like to stay out all day. Well, if I'm in a mm-hmm. bad day situation and I know elk's in an area, I'm going back to camp. I'm just getting the heck mm-hmm. out of Dodge. I know that they're in that area. I'm going to let it rest till the evening, and I'm going to be in there and sneaking right back into where I need to be to make something happen. I didn't have to worry about my scent or anything <clears throat> like that in the area. Yeah. Or going going to other elk there. But I'll tell you this, man. The way I decide between moving and calling and setting up is depending on – what i'm seeing hearing or smelling right right? Mm -hmm. i have to have something like that to tell me or i'm in a situation where like me and cole did one day man that it was already past the the midday everything was getting a little bit warm we got into an area above that's possible bedding right there and it was a perfect funnel situation where we just decided to have fun and put on scenario before we end up taking a nap or getting out of there man and sure Mm -hmm. enough we call in a, a small bull just a little spike bull to come in but that was just a midday blast that we were doing we were just having a good time right so that's probably well i that's probably the most important thing you said in, in that part of the discussion joe was have fun with it yeah yeah, right? yeah. It's, it's, mm-hmm. don't Enjoy forget it. to just i mean travis and i talked about it right? i love doing a breeding sequence it'll whoop your butt but man there is something just so much fun mm-hmm. about doing that sequence but yeah you gotta have fun with what what whatever scenario you know tickles yeah. your fancy have fun with it if you ain't having fun with it man find another scenario yeah and have a purpose you know, have yeah. a purpose yeah. with the scenario yeah well and, I, and i'll tell you this i learned from this guy a long time ago too you know let's say that you you, know, you take that high country that jonathan was talking about you see you know uh, a bull up there with some cows and you see them go into the trees they feed into the trees man and nobody else has been in that area to mess with them what's that going to mean you know they're yeah. going to be coming yeah. right back out they right come right back to mm-hmm. where they were we just yeah. got to be patient yeah and so yeah. sometimes you got to remember these elk will put themselves in the best defensible position a lot of times yeah. so sometimes you got to if you can get in a situation where you can get around and you can be in a good spot to to work them during the midday great if not plan on what's going to happen for that afternoon or evening you know and and then make a new game plan on that but you know for me before i decide to do a setup and a scenario it's kind of like it's it's what travis is doing you know i know travis already knows from year after year when he's been there he knows where those especially early season where those bulls layers are man where their bedding Mm -hmm. areas are and travis knows how to go and you know just chum that spot man just throw out a little bit of bait get them to bite because he knows that 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 is an area that bulls like to go year after year after year and if he doesn't find anything there he's going to go to the next spot and he's going to work Mm -hmm. that one a little bit and then he's going to move on yeah yeah if I'm doing the same thing, if I'm going through some place and I smell those critters or I'm on fresh track right there mm-hmm. and, and the mm-hmm. time of day dictates that they're still in that area, well, then I can just stop and do a little scenario there. Okay. So, yeah, that's, that's one thing I do, Joe, like a lot of my spots I have to quad into when I'm quadding in my nose is working overtime. And the minute you, you cross that smell trail of an elk, even on your quad you smell it it's like oh okay there's elk right here you know so that's one thing that you can't an elk can't get away from that smell it's in the air it's on the wind currents if you smell them they're within a couple two three hundred yards for sure hundred yep. percent so yep. you better park that bike and, and start working it so the next time we come on y'all we're going to we're going to go ahead and finish up with the rest of these i think it's going to be a great topic um when we hit next time um, and, uh, 
I, I, we did it. We had uh, some callers that called in. Uh, yeah. we, we even, and for people listening that didn't know, caller number three there that called. Who was that dude that that talked about uh, what? What did what did he say? You had that they wanted to sell guy. It was um. Daisy, Some Daisy Dukes. Dukes. Daisy Dukes. Yeah. Daisy Dukes, man. Daisy Dukes. Yeah, but he said that about Cole, but he said something about your stylish gators or something like that. I don't know what he Yeah. <laughs> huh? Yeah, he said the he There's said the guy did planche yeah. gators or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't even hear that one. Oh yeah. <laughs> I was stuck on Cole Wilkes and the Daisy Dukes, man. Yeah. <laughs> he got the stash going on. All I could picture was General Lee and him in some short ass shorts with some boots on. <laughs> <laughs> that's my style man uh, no, that's, that's what, what it was what i was saying trouser check yeah <laughs> keith, caveman keith heard what it was it, it was the it was the guy du planche leg warmers yeah you know we've talked about <laughs> travis so, flash dance ones yeah, yeah. <laughs> we talked about travis's company mark carlton's company that uh pretty is fantastic calls but our brother guy de he's got a, a a little side gig too uh with western fly covers man guy real quick can you tell us how they can get their hands on a western fly cover that we all use now to cover our mm -hmm. our very valuable gear that's in our our backpacks the, the best way right now is to jump on elkbros.com go into that store buy one of those fly covers not only do you get the fly cover but you get entered into the elk bros giveaway uh, outside of that, jump on westernflycovers.com. Um, if you have any questions, hit me up. But yeah, we got our pack fly covers, our bino fly covers, and working on some other stuff. But uh, yeah, material stuff is killing us there. So, and I would be that, remiss Gil. if I don't give the legend a shout out as well. The Cimarron Silversmith himself, RC Knox, yeah. has got his jewelry now in the store. Guys, if y'all want yeah. something done with your elk teeth, I mean, <laughs> he makes some incredible jewelry that we all sport. Uh, we're kind of spoiled by him, uh, but at the end <laughs> of the day, his his stuff's all wow. handmade right there uh, in, in New Mexico. And if you want to reach out and talk to RC or have any of his custom jewelry you can check them out on our web page as well absolutely man and you ain't gonna there wear was some... it's gonna be a mantle piece i think it was <laughs> albert guy um that said that uh yeah. that rc saved him because he was buying all this elk bros gear and so he ended up able to buy some some uh earrings. some earrings for his wife to get some of those <laughs> points for the giveaway that's a smart man right there both my daughter yeah, exactly. and my wife, I, i've been lucky to kill quite a few bulls and both my daughter and my wife have elk, you know elk tooth ear earrings that uh rc's made my son has an unbelievable ranger buckle with his elk teeth in it i mean i do too as well and he just builds some timeless pieces that are unbelievable and represent his character as well. Cause I mean, uh, you know, he's a real cowboy. And at the end of the day, uh, you know, we want to support RC and, and help him in his endeavor as well. So we have one last question, um, before we get off and, um, uh, one of our fellows asked, um, so who's the real leader of the Venezuela mafia? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, they both showed up. <laughs> so That's you saw my response. I didn't see it. No, I, 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 I want to see what, who he thinks it is, is, is the leader. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I want to see y'all arm wrestle. I think yeah, my brother. Yeah, yeah. I think my brother exactly. Manano is going to acquiesce in uh, in in let him know that I, he'll give him the south. He'll keep the north to himself. <laughs> I, I I answered it online. I said we're, we're not going to lie to you. I am. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you want to talk about the founder and the actual <laughs> key caller of the Venezuelan mafia. See, there That's you go. The, they're right already right. responding. They're already <laughs> responding. Look at that. <laughs> uh, no uh, thank you, Brandon. Hey, go ahead and close us out, brother. brother. <laughs> Guys, 
on ep an epic show for sure when we have listeners call in and and stuff like that it's always good to be on with my brothers uh for sure if you like what we're doing please subscribe rate and review us you got to go to apple podcast or itunes to review us and you can check out more elk hunting content at elkbros.com and just a reminder if any of our listeners would like their questions answered on our show and i promise we'll do a better job of getting to all of those just send your questions to info at elk Bros. Com. And like we say down here in the Lone Star State, husbands, kiss your wives, wives, kiss your husbands, keep your broad head sharp and your powder dry. And we'll see you next week right here on Blue Collar Elk Hunting. Peace, 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 peace. everybody. Peace. Peace. Right, Thank you. <laughs>